All right. Hey, everybody. It's two o'clock. Uh, I am Rob. Thanks for joining me on this stream. I am going to talk about serverless security. This is something new that we're trying on the AWS serverless developer advocate team. We're joined here in the chat with uh, some of my colleagues as well. So if you have any questions, please just go ahead and ask them as we go. All right. I've got a little bit of content teed up that we can walk through to give you some good examples. And then from there, uh, I'll just answer your questions. All right. So real quick about me and about the team. First, I should probably mute my stream. We are here for you. We're your route back to the product team. So if there's something that can help you build more effectively with serverless, please let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Uh, we're also here to help you understand how to create and how to build with all the serverless products at AWS. So part of that is doing this content like you're gonna see today. Uh, real quick, what we're going to cover today in general is just IAM and the principle of least privilege. I'll go over that real fast. Letting the defaults work for you. So there's a couple of shortcuts that you can do here that give you some smartly configured policies. Um, and then there's two sides of IAM when you talk about IAM and Lambda functions in particular. There's a resource-based policy which governs what can invoke your Lambda function. And then there's the execution role, and those are the privileges that your Lambda function has. So for most of my time today, we're gonna to focus on that execution role. I'm gonna show you an example of a very, very narrowly scoped execution role with DynamoDB, and then we're gonna modify it to prove to ourselves that, uh, that it does what we want it to do. All right? So let's jump into my browser. I would like to talk about the defaults real quick. And it looks like that's not gonna be cooperative. So give me a second, this was just up. Well, like I said, folks, this is my first time. So let's see, oh, I need to make it visible. All right, appreciate your patience, I'll get there. All right, so AWS Serverless Application Model or SAM provides some out of the box templates for resources that you might wanna use in your SAM templates. Um, there's a list of them, and I'm gonna paste this link in the chat in just a second. But it gives you these basic ones that you can use in all of your SAM functions based on what you need to do. So for example, if you need a policy that allows you to perform all your CRUD operations against DynamoDB, you can just include this uh, DynamoDB policy. Uh, similarly, we have ones if you only need to read or write, all right? Same thing for S3 buckets. So don't go out starting with stars. That's probably the biggest thing to consider with your uh, IAM policies and your functions. Anywhere that you can avoid it, you don't wanna put a star, whether that's um, for an action, whether that's for a resource. Uh, you, you just wanna be scoping these things and restricting them and using the functionality that's provided by SAM. So again, I said I would give you this template. I'm gonna drop it in the chat here. You can find that by searching for serverless application model, serverless policy templates, in case you're uh, watching this video later and don't have access to the links, all right? So when we talk about a resource-based policy, let me go back to the console here. And we take, for example, one of these Lambda functions that was created by Sam. In this case, this is backed by uh, API Gateway. So we see here that this allows API Gateway, the service, to invoke this Lambda function with this endpoint. And so if you try to call it from outside of there, it's not gonna work. And when you look at this in Visual Studio Code, we see that that comes automatically for you because you've set up this event here to trigger your Lambda function. So part of what Sam does for you by using CloudFormation and doing this transformation is it gives you the ability to hook up an API gateway endpoint and get that proper restriction without having to specify it. So we've gone ahead and taken care of that for you. And that's that first part of it. That's what I talked about 
um, as the exec, sorry, not the execution role, but as the invoke policy. The second part is the uh, execution role. And I want to take as an example here, this, uh, there's four in this example application. And this is just a very basic um, app with four Lambda functions, a reader and a writer for customers and orders, right? And it uses the preferred uh, single table DynamoDB pattern. And we use prefixes to determine whether uh, an item is a customer or an order. And if you look at this order reader policy, all that it should be able to do if you think about it is retrieve orders out of that database. It shouldn't be able to do anything else related to customers or any other information that you have, right? Because maybe you have a, a packing workstation and it should have access to generate a pack list, but it doesn't need to know anything about customers. It shouldn't have access to that private data. So what we've done here is we've created a policy and we allow this function to call DynamoDB get item against this resource. Now this resource is another shortcut that Sam has handled for us. We've defined this app table in our template. So it can't call get item on any other table, only the one that's here in our app. And then the key to this is this little block of code. So the condition where it can call get item on that table is for any value where the key is like, or in our case begins with, the order partition key prefix and a star. Uh, and this is where it's safe to use that star because we've given this match ahead of time, right? So the other uh, functions in here are a customer writer, a customer reader, and an order writer. And so we're gonna call those just to put some data in our DynamoDB table real quick. And if we go back over here to DynamoDB, let's go ahead and clear these items. And now we see we have no items here. Let's go back into Visual Studio Code and let's post a customer and we get back this uh, customer ID that was generated. Quick note here, all this information is generated using a faker package, so none of this is anybody's name or social security number or any of that. We just put it in there so that you can sort of see the example. And these are being created on the fly. Uh, so this is the one we just created, this 84C6 here. I'm gonna go ahead and delete the other two because it looks like I might have overlapped with something. Now if we reload this, yeah, we just got that one that we just created. And then we can create an order. And same thing, right? This is the happy path. So this is what we expect. Our customer writer creates a customer. Our customer, or I'm sorry, our order writer creates an order. So we can check the other endpoints by either, we can just take this here out of Visual Studio Code. And I realized that I didn't show you the uh, DynamoDB terminal when I switched back there. Sorry about that. Um, let me hide code real quick. And we see that we have these two, uh, two rows here. So this is the one that we see was just created in Visual Studio Code as well. So the other two endpoints that we've uh, created here are the readers. And we take the customer reader, and again, this is just to show you the happy path. We get back some fake information on this customer. We go back, we copy our order ID, and we see that all four of these are working as we'd expect. I'm just gonna overwrite this real quick. Hooray, okay. So that was for the order. If we try to change that to the customer, that's not gonna make any sense. Uh, so it shouldn't find it. And what's actually gonna happen here is it's just gonna return null, right? Because there's nothing there. That's not a security violation because our function is handling that transformation. It's adding the prefix. And if we go and we take a look, this is the uh, order reader function here. It's written in Go. Uh, the main part of this is in our handler here. And so what we do for the reader is we get the, the ID and then we affix this prefix, right? 
This prefix is passed in again from the template as an environment variable. So we have this DynamoDB prefix. We pass in this reference that we've defined in our template. And then we use this constant to pull again that DynamoDB prefix out. And so whenever we go and we ask for a key, we're asking for that prefix that was passed to us. And in this case, it's O. And if we switch back over to the uh, management console, you see that highlighted row there is, uh, it begins with O because that's how we partition our keys. So I'm gonna change this. Let's pretend that I'm, I'm an attacker and I've gotten access to this function somehow via a dependency, right? So you use some PDF generation library or you know some other dependency that had a vulnerability in it uh, that's not there in your customer function, but I've got a foothold. So now I wanna go out and collect a bunch of information on your customers. Or let's say I'm just a malicious employee. So instead of doing this, I happen to know what our prefix is, right? So I'm gonna say, give me some customer information and I'm going to redeploy this function to simulate that. Uh, I've also used the guided deploy previous to this with Sam, if you're not familiar with it, really powerful, really good way to uh, get those deploys down in time. And so now what's going to happen, the order partition key prefix is defined as O, but we've maliciously modified it to C. So if we go back over here, to the management console. Let's go ahead and grab a customer ID. And then once that finishes deploying, we're gonna use the order endpoint that we've inserted this vulnerability into to try and extract some customer information that we know is there. All right, so again, remember, we've hacked the order endpoint. I need to show you this back in Visual Studio Code. We've hacked the order endpoint and deployed a malicious function, right? It's gonna prepend that customer prefix here. And then we've given it this customer ID that we took out of our database just knowing it. But you can imagine we're scanning or whatever. We're trying to get some custom customer information. And you'll see in this case, what we get is an internal server error. Um, probably not descriptive to the user, but what we didn't get is customer information. So if we go back over here, and we look at our order reader function, we can go to the monitoring tab and we can view our logs in CloudWatch. And here we have the execution that we would have just gone against and we get exactly what we'd expect to see here, right? So we have this access denied exception. This function is not authorized to get an item on that table with that condition. And the log doesn't give you the condition, but it's actually done exactly what we wanted it to do. We got in there, we injected some malicious code, we tried to read some information that we shouldn't have access to, and we were denied. So this is exactly what, uh, what we should see happening here. All right. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code. I see Ed J. Geek likes my, uh, my code layout. Thanks. It's nice and big. I can share my plugins with you. Um, mainly it's all about raising your font size, so. All right, so that was it. I just wanted to make this a quick example of how you can tightly scope your functions. Uh, I don't see any questions from anybody in the chat. So if you are watching this video later when we post it and you have questions, um, you can send them to me on Twitter at RTSRob, um, or you can contact me via Twitch at my next live stream. I'm gonna to try to do this every Thursday. So if there's a topic that you would like to see covered, uh, whether it's specific to Go or specific to security, um, just let me know. All right, we do have one question in here from Julian asking about what about per function IAM policies or functions shared, policies shared across functions. Um, every policy definition is going to be a question of risk. Right. So there are plenty of use cases where you will want to share some of those predefined policies that I showed you. For example, if you have an S3 read only access to something like uh, images or image thumbnails, something that's just not sensitive, 
then you can reuse those across functions. Um, in SAM, however, you can't define custom policies as globals, right? So when you're defining inline policies like we're doing down here, those have to be defined on a per function basis. In general, as your code base evolves, I would, I would say if you can put it on the function, it's a best practice to put it on the function because your ideal state is to have every single function scoped only to exactly the data that it needs and nothing more, right? Because as your system gets more and more complex, any sort of failure in that system represents a risk. So in general, my advice is to have those, those uh, uh, inline policies, which have to be one per function, uh, be defined as one per function. Anybody else got any other questions? Thank you, Julian, for the question. All right, well, I only plan on being here about 15 minutes today. Um, I would like to get this code out to you. Give me some time to get that done. Um, in the meantime, let me check and make sure if I had any other references I wanted to drop for you. No, I gave you the, uh, the serverless policy templates, so definitely check those out, whether you're connecting to an SQS queue, uh, whether you're connecting to S3 buckets, DynamoDB, there's a lot there that's pre-done for you, so leverage that. Uh, definitely don't run around with your policies wide open. Um, so with that, I'm gonna wrap up today. Again, my DMs are open. If you have any questions for me on Twitter, I'm RTS Rob, and I thank you all for coming out today. Appreciate it.